A Medieval Romance by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. A Medieval Romance by Mark Twain. Chapter One The Secret Revealed. It was night. Stillness reigned in the grand old feudal castle of Klugenstein. The year 1222 was drawing to a close. Far away, up in the tallest of the castle's towers, a single light glimmered. A secret council was being held there. The stern old lord of Klugenstein sat in a chair of state meditating. Presently he said with a tender accent, My daughter. A young man of noble presence, clad from head to heel in knightly mail, answered, Speak, father. My daughter, the time is come for the revealing of the mystery that hath puzzled all your young life. Know, then, that it had its birth in the matters which I shall now unfold. My brother Ulrich is the great Duke of Brandenburg. Our father on his deathbed decreed that if no son were born to Ulrich, the succession should pass to my house, provided a son were born to me. And further, in case no son were born to either but only daughters, then the succession should pass to Ulrich's daughter, if she proved stainless. If she did not, my daughter should succeed, if she retained a blameless name. And so I and my old wife here prayed fervently for the good boon of a son. But the prayer was in vain. You were born to us. I was in despair. I saw the mighty prize slipping from my grasp, the splendid dream vanishing away. And I had been so hopeful. Five years had Ulrich lived in wedlock, and yet his wife had borne no heir of either sex. But hold, I said, all is not lost. A saving scheme had shot athwart my brain. You were born at midnight. Only the leech, the nurse, and six waiting women knew your sex. I hanged them, every one of them, before an hour had sped. Next morning all the barony went mad with rejoicing over the proclamation that a son was born to Klugenstein, an heir to mighty Brandenburg. And well the secret has been kept. Your mother's own sister nursed your infancy, and from that time forward we feared nothing. When you were ten years old, a daughter was born to Ulrich. We grieved but hoped for good results from measles or physicians or other natural enemies of infancy, but were always disappointed. She lived, she throve, heaven's malison upon her. But it is nothing. We are safe. For, ha ha, have we not a son, and is not our son the future duke? Our well-beloved Conrad, is it not so? For, woman of eight and twenty years as you are, my child, none other name than that hath ever fallen upon you. Now it hath come to pass that age hath laid its hand upon my brother, and he waxes feeble. The cares of state do tax him sore. Therefore he wills that you shall come to him, and be already duke, in act, though not yet in name. Your servitors are ready. You journey forth to-night. Now listen well. Remember every word I say. There is a law as old as Germany that if any woman sit for a single instant in the great ducal chair before she hath been absolutely crowned in presence of the people, she shall die. So heed my words. Pretend humility. Pronounce your judgments from the premier's chair which stands at the foot of the throne. Do this until you are crowned and safe. It is not likely that your sex will ever be discovered. But still it is the part of wisdom to make all things as safe as may be in this treacherous earthly life. O oh, my father, is it for this that my life hath been a lie? Was it that I might cheat my unoffending cousin of her rights? Spare me, father, spare your child. What hussy! In this my reward for the august fortune my brain has wrought for thee. By the bones of my father this pulling sentiment of thine but ill accords with my humor. Betake thee to the duke instantly, and beware how thou meddlest with my purpose. Let this suffice of the conversation. It is enough for us to know that the prayers, the entreaties, and the tears of the gentle-natured girl availed nothing. They nor anything could move the stout old lord of Klugenstein. And so, at last, with a heavy heart, the daughter saw the castle gates close behind her, and found herself riding away in the darkness, surrounded by a knightly array of armed vassals and a brave following of servants. The old baron sat silent for many minutes after his daughter's departure, and then he turned to his sad wife and said, Dame, our matters seem speeding fairly. 
It is full three months since I sent the shrewd and handsome Count Dietzen on his devilish mission to my brother's daughter Constance. If he fail, we are not wholly safe. But if he do succeed, no power can bar our girl from being Duchess. Even though ill-fortune should decree, she never be Duke. My heart is full of bodings, yet all may still be well. Tush, woman! Leave the owls to croak, to bed with ye, and dream of Brandenburg and grandeur! CHAPTER Two, FESTIVITY AND TEARS Six days after the occurrences related in the above chapter, the brilliant capital of the Duchy of Brandenburg was resplendent with military pageantry, and noisy with the rejoicings of loyal multitudes. For Conrad, the young heir to the crown, was come. The old duke's heart was full of happiness, for Conrad's handsome person and graceful bearing had won his love at once. The great halls of Thai Palace were thronged with nobles, who welcomed Conrad bravely and so bright and happy did all things seem that he felt his fears and sorrows passing away and giving place to a comforting contentment. But in a remote apartment of the palace a scene of a different nature was transpiring. By a window stood the duke's only child, the Lady Constance. Her eyes were red and swollen and full of tears. She was alone. Presently she fell to weeping anew and said aloud, The villain Dietzen is gone, has fled the dukedom. I could not believe it at first, but, alas, it is too true. And I loved him so, I dared to love him, though I knew the Duke my father would never let me wed him. I loved him, but now I hate him. With all my soul I hate him. Oh, what is to become of me? I am lost, lost, lost. I shall go mad. CHAPTER Three, THE PLOT THICKENS Few months drifted by. All men published the praises of the young Conrad's government, and extolled the wisdom of his judgments, the mercifulness of his sentences, and the modesty with which he bore himself in his great office. The old duke soon gave everything into his hands, and sat apart and listened with proud satisfaction while his heir delivered the decrees of the crown from the seat of the premier. It seemed plain that one so loved and praised and honored of all men as Conrad was could not be otherwise than happy. But strange enough, he was not for he saw with dismay that the princess Constance had begun to love him. The love of the rest of the world was happy fortune for him, but this was freighted with danger. And he saw, moreover, that the delighted duke had discovered his daughter's passion likewise, and was already dreaming of a marriage. Every day somewhat of the deep sadness that had been in the princess's face faded away. Every day hope and animation beamed brighter from her eye and by and by even vagrant smiles visited the face that had been so troubled. Conrad was appalled. He bitterly cursed himself for having yielded to the instinct that had made him seek the companionship of one of his own sex when he was new and a stranger in the palace, when he was sorrowful and yearned for a sympathy such as only women can give or feel. He now began to avoid his cousin. But this only made matters worse, for, naturally enough, the more he avoided her the more she cast herself in his way. He marveled at first at this, and next it startled him. The girl haunted him, she hunted him, she happened upon him at all times in all places, in the night as well as in the day. She seemed singularly anxious. There was surely a mystery somewhere. This could not go on forever. All the world was talking about it. The Duke was beginning to look perplexed. Poor Conrad was becoming a very ghost through the dread and dire distress. One day, as he was emerging from a private ante-room attached to the picture-gallery, Constance confronted him, and seizing both his hands in hers, exclaimed, "'Oh, why do you avoid me? What, what have I done? What have I said to lose your kind opinion of me? For surely I had it once. Conrad, do not despise me, but pity a tortured heart. I cannot, cannot hold the words unspoken longer, lest they kill me. I love you, Conrad. There, despise me if you must, but they would be uttered.' Conrad was speechless. Constance hesitated a moment, and then misinterpreted his silence. A wild gladness flamed in her eyes, and she flung her arms about his neck and said, You relent, you relent. You can love me, you will love me. Oh, say you will, my own, my worshipped Conrad. Conrad groaned aloud. A sickly pallor overspread his countenance, and he trembled like an aspen. Presently, in desperation, he thrust the poor girl from him and cried, You know not what you ask. It is forever and ever impossible!" And then he fled like a criminal and left the princess stupefied with amazement. A minute afterward she was crying and sobbing there, and Conrad was crying and sobbing in his chamber. Both were in despair, both save ruin staring them in the face. 
By and by Constance rose slowly to her feet and moved away, saying, To think that he was despising my love at the very moment that I thought it was melting his cruel heart. I hate him. He spurned me, did this man. He spurned me from him like a dog. CHAPTER Four, THE AWFUL REVELATION Time passed on. A settled sadness rested once more upon the countenance of the good Duke's daughter. She and Conrad were seen together no more now. The Duke grieved at this, but as the weeks wore away Conrad's color came back to his cheeks, and his old-time vivacity to his eye, and he administered the government with a clear and steadily ripening wisdom. Presently a strange whisper began to be heard about the palace. It grew louder. It spread farther. The gossips of the city got a hold of it. It swept the dukedom. And this is what the whisper said. The Lady Constance hath given birth to a child. When the Lord of Klugenstein heard it, he swung his plumed helmet thrice around his head and shouted, Long live Duke Conrad, for, lo, his crown is sure from this day forward. Dietzen has done his errand well, and the good scoundrel shall be rewarded. And he spread the tidings far and wide and for eight and forty hours no soul in all the barony but did dance and sing, carouse and illuminate, to celebrate the great event, and all at proud and happy old Klugenstein's expense. CHAPTER V. THE FRIGHTFUL CATASTROPHE The trial was at hand. All the great lords and barons of Brandenburg were assembled in the Hall of Justice in the Ducal Palace. No space was left unoccupied where there was room for a spectator to stand or sit. Conrad, clad in purple and ermine, sat in the premier's chair, and on either side sat the great judges of the realm. The old duke had sternly commanded that the trial of his daughter should proceed without favor, and then he had taken to his bed broken-hearted. His days were numbered. Poor Conrad had begged, as for his very life, that he might be spared the misery of sitting in judgment upon his cousin's crime, but it did not avail. The saddest heart in all that great assemblage was in Conrad's breast. The gladdest was in his father's, for unknown to his daughter, Conrad, the old Baron Klugenstein, was come and was among the crowd of nobles, triumphant in the swelling fortunes of his house. After the heralds had made due proclamation and the other preliminaries had followed, the venerable Lord Chief Justice said, Prisoner, stand forth. The unhappy princess rose and stood unveiled before the vast multitude. The Lord Chief Justice continued, Most noble lady, before the great judges of this realm it hath been charged and proven that out of holy wedlock your grace hath given birth unto a child, and by our ancient law the penalty is death, excepting in one sole contingency whereof his grace, the acting duke, our good lord Conrad, will advertise you in his solemn sentence now. Wherefore, give heed. Conrad stretched forth the reluctant scepter, and in the selfsame moment the womanly heart beneath his robe yearned pityingly toward the doomed prisoner, and the tears came into his eyes. He opened his lips to speak, but the Lord Chief Justice said quickly, Not there, Your Grace, not there. It is not lawful to pronounce judgment upon any of the ducal line, save from the ducal throne. A shudder went to the heart of poor Conrad, and a tremor shook the iron frame of his old father likewise. Conrad had not been crowned. Dared he profane the throne? He hesitated and turned pale with fear. But it must be done. Wandering eyes were already upon him. They would be suspicious eyes if he hesitated longer. He ascended the throne. Presently he stretched forth the scepter again and said, Prisoner, in the name of our sovereign lord Ulrich, Duke of Brandenburg, I proceed to the solemn duty that hath devolved upon me. Give heed to my words. By the ancient law of the land, except you produce the partner of your guilt and deliver him up to the executioner, you must surely die. Embrace this opportunity. Save yourself while yet you may. Name the father of your child. A solemn hush fell upon the great court, a silence so profound that men could hear their own hearts beating. Then the princess slowly turned with eyes gleaming with hate and pointed her finger straight at Conrad and said, Thou art the man. An appalling conviction of his helpless, hopeless peril struck a chill to Conrad's heart like the chill of death itself. What power on earth could save him? To disprove the charge he must reveal that he was a woman, and for an uncrowned woman to sit in the ducal chair was death. At one and the same moment he and his grim old father swooned and fell to the ground. The remainder of this thrilling and eventful story will not be found in this or any other publication, either now or at any future time. 
The truth is, I have got my hero, or heroine, into such a particularly close place that I do not see how I am ever going to get him or her out of it again. And therefore I will wash my hands of the whole business, and leave that person to get out the best way that offers, or else stay there. I thought it was going to be easy enough to straighten out that little difficulty, but it looks different now. End of A Medieval Romance by Mark Twain